everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the very first event of the new year 2022 at the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers. This event is co-hosted by Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. I'm Indu Saxena, Deputy Director of the Consortium. Our today's discussion is focused on democracy, a conversation on the future of democracy. And for this session, we have extraordinary panelists with us, Dr. Mimi Win Bird, uh, Dr. Ku Ying Hui, Dr. George Saroka, and uh, Dr. Satoru Nagao. So before uh, moving ahead, I would like to invite the director of the consortium, Dr. Ernest Gunasekra Rockwell, for his opening remarks. Doc, over to you. Uh, thanks, Indu, and, and thanks to all of our panelists and our, our guests for joining us today. It's a very important discussion to have. You know, we, we look in the news and uh, we see the, the, the rise of uh, authoritarianism throughout the, the world. This is your um, at any rate, as I was saying, um, we, and I'll, I'll edit all of that out, so uh, at least it won't make it onto the YouTube channel. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, authoritarianism on its rise again. Uh, you know, this is something that uh, those of us who are historians and, and, and whatnot uh, you know, look back and see you know, parallels, obviously, with uh, what happened in early 20th century, middle, mid 20th century. And uh, it's, it's disconcerting to see it, it uh, rearing its ugly head again. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it's happening at a time when it seems that the democracies around the world are, are, are kind of, you know, not not uh, not in the best position to stand up to it. And uh, again, you know, that kind of harkens back to, to uh, parallels that we've seen in history as well. And so it's it's, it's important uh, for us to have this conversation and to, to try to provide our policymakers, decision makers, uh, military leaders, academicians and others uh, with 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 the, uh, the instruction and, and kind of guidance that they, they might need to, to you know, get on the right page you know, so that we can Put out a, an alternative package of offerings for uh, countries that are kind of on the fence, and I think our, what we're going to see today from our panelists is, you know, some of that discussion, and, and then obviously some self-reflection too on, you know, how is it that we uh, in democracies can uh, go forth and, and uh, market our, our our way of of life, our way of governance when it's kind of messy, right? Uh, you know, all you have to do is look at the last several elections that we've had here in the states. And, and see the kind of divisions that we have here at home. And, and then you know, it's kind of easy to understand how perhaps it's a difficult message to sell around the world. Whereas with uh, authoritarian states, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty on message. Uh, you might not agree with the message, but uh, uh, the message is pretty clear and, uh, and, and very um, uh, well controlled uh, in, in, in opposition to what we see in our own countries. So uh, I hope that'll be part of the discussion, but uh, I know Indu's got some, uh, some great questions great questions in the package. And uh, then we'll obviously have some input from the audience as well. Um, and uh, looking forward to it. And uh, it, this is this is a great uh, opportunity for us. This is we're on the cusp of the first anniversary of the consortium. So I want to thank everybody for helping us ring in the new year uh, with our, our, our uh, programming. And uh, it's also the fifth year anniversary for the journal, uh, which is, uh, I've been told, the, the, the benchmark milestone to determine whether or not uh, a, a publication is going to survive. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that, that this is a, a good indicator that that's going to be the case. So at any rate, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Andrew, to, to guide us in the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. Uh, before moving ahead, let me read the disclaimer here, a little bit housekeeping. The views and opinions expressed or implied in this discussion are those of the participant and should not be construed as carrying the official sanction of the Department of Defense, Air Force, Air Education and Training Command, Air University or other agencies or departments of the US government or their international equivalents. Now, please allow me to introduce our today's uh, distinguished speakers. We have Dr. Mimi Van Baird with us. Dr. Baird is professor at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. Her research, teaching, and publications focused on US-Myanmar relations, security dynamics in Southeast Asia, and related issues. 
She is also an adjunct fellow at East West Center. Prior to this, she served as Lieutenant Colonel in US Army and was positioned at various job positions. We have Dr. Ku Yinghui with us. Uh, Dr. Dr. Yinghui is the head and senior lecturer at the Department of International and Strategic Studies, University of Malaya. Her research interests in, include civil society, social movements, human rights, and democratization with the regional focus on Southeast Asia and ASEAN, especially Malaysia and Timor Leste. We have Dr. George Saroka with us. And Dr. Saroka is Assistant Director of Undergraduate Studies and a lecturer on government at Harvard University. His area of expertise includes international relations, democracy and nationalism, Arctic politics, democratic transition in comparative perspectives, politics of history and memory, religion and politics, status seeking behavior in IR. His regional focus of research is on Russia and the post-communist states of Eastern Europe. We have Dr. Sucharu Nagao with us. Dr. Nagao is a visiting fellow at Hudson Institute. He is an expert on US-Japan, India security cooperation. Dr. Nagao holds several other research positions. He has authored several books and articles on security issues. We have Director of the Consortium, Dr. Ernest Gurnasekra Rockwell. Dr. Rockwell is the Director of the Consortium as uh, we uh, heard from him. He is a cross-disciplinary scholar, editor, writer, researcher, and administrator with a multivariant background in publishing, social sciences, languages, writing, editing, teaching, and the military. So this is a brief this introduction for our panelists because if I will read it, so yeah, we won't have, we won't get much time to, for our discussion. Uh, now, moving to our session or moving to our show, I would like to invite Dr. Mimi Wynn Bird for uh, her remarks of her comments. Dr. Bird. Oh, oh. Okay. The floor is well, yours. Uh, I, the, something, uh, thank you for having me and, and uh, aloha to everybody from Hawaii. Um, I hope that everybody else is staying warm, but uh, today for us is about uh, a little bit uh, in the 80s, early uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So <laughs> we're enjoying a good weather. I know everybody else is snowed in and being cold, according to the news from this morning. But anyway, so, um, so I just want to be a, a brief, just a brief, uh, you know, set up. Um, you know, I've been following, uh, of course, the Myanmar uh, military coup since the, you know, the February 1st of last year. So, you know, and, and recently I've been uh, doing several interviews with the uh, media outlets and trying to assess where the Myanmar, where Myanmar, you know, the, the whole coup is. And, it, you know, um, uh, uh, Myanmar is not just, um, uh, not just Myanmar issue. It has a larger component of this, uh, the, um, the tension between the, the, the two system, authoritarianism and um, the, the democracy, right? So uh, even in the, I think in, in Asia Pacific region, uh, uh, in the Pacific region, I think that a lot of people are looking at it as a kind of a symbolic, uh, you know, the struggle between two systems. And also, um, you know, both the ASEAN and the United States um, credibility is, on the line as well, right? And then especially for the United States, US, the new administration has said, you know, that democracy is important. It is a part of our uh, 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 value and core element of our, uh, our um, foreign policy. And the right here is being tested, you know? And so I think that, I mean, uh, Ying Hu can uh, uh, talk more about it because she's from uh, Malaysia and how Malaysia is looking at this element as a U.S. commitment, you know, the evidence of U.S. commitment to um, at least Southeast Asia anyway. So, um, so what happening in Myanmar is, I think it's beyond Myanmar, and it is, a, I, in, in our conversation today, it is, I think is relevant in a way that it is a, a, a contest between two systems is playing out, and Myanmar is at the front line at this moment. So thank you for having me. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Witt, for your comments and for your uh, insights. Uh, like it's it's a uh, it has been a year almost like uh, after the military coup in Myanmar, and it's a uh, definitely it's a matter of grave concern for the democracy and democratic uh, countries, and especially ASEAN too. Like uh, uh, every day we have been like uh, watching and listening the news that ASEAN said that uh, Myanmar is not following the five. Uh, five points plan of that what ASEAN decided in last April. Thank you very much. And uh, now I would like. Oh, you got muted. For his uh, comments and for his presentation, Dr. Nagao. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. So today. I'll prepare one presentation. In this, uh, I want to talk about uh, US-China competition. Mm. Simply said, the America will win the competition against China, I want to say. The fate of democracies depends on competition between democratic US and authoritarian China. That's why I explain next 10 minutes. So if other country believe that, non-democratic China is model for success. The democratic countries will increasingly lose influence in the future. So therefore, the US has stepped up its effort to promote democratic norms and values in, its, in relation with China. So, but recently there has been plenty of information indicate that China is catching up to the US. According to the, to the uh, think tank in Sweden, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, they simply, uh, simply uh, between 2011 to 2020, the US decreased its military expenditure by 10%. During the same period, China increased its military expenditure 76%. The UK think tank, the Center for Economic and Business Research predicted that China will overtake the US to become the largest economy by 2028. So Western value are also under threat, including democracy. According to the Freedom House, the number of free countries declined from 89 in 2005 to 82 in 2020. A number of not free countries increased from 45 to 54. And the recent situation in Afghanistan, recent uh, last year, uh, Taliban took over the country after NATO troops withdrew, was symbolic incident that damaged America's image and credibility. Even in such situation, I still believe that America is on the road to win the competition with China. There are three reasons. First, the US is still stronger than China. CIPRI's database I have already introduced indicates that US military expenditure in 2020 was three times bigger than the China's. And the quality of the equipment is also matter. All US submarines are the nuclear powered, but main Chinese submarines forces are consisted by conventional powers. Even if the China will catch up the GDP of the US, I introduced as the data of the UK think tank, the, their population uh, will be more than the four times bigger than the US. Chinese population will be the more than four times bigger. So this means that uh, when we check the GDP per capita, um, China's uh, GDP per capita, will not so long, so big. And in addition, as for the uh, UK think tank CEBR's prediction, 2028 has not come, 2028 uh, China will overtake, but uh, this year has not come yet. Uh, any crisis uh, such as the spread of the new variant of the COVID-19 can change such kind of expectation. So, and about the value, of course, including democracy, 82 free countries still outnumber the 54 not free countries. So the US is still stronger than China. Secondly, the US has many former allies, 
U.S. has many formal allies, including NATO, the Central American country, uh, yeah, Central and uh, South American countries, the Israel, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, the Philippines, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan, 52 in total. And but China, only formal ally is North Korea. Indeed, the number of the allies is a very important factor in determining the which side eventually prevail. For example, the, in the World War One, winning side comprised 32 countries and losing side uh, just four. And in the World War Two, the 54 versus eight. And the, the US Soviet Cold War, 54 versus 26. So every time, winner side has bigger group. And thirdly, recent action by the US indicate that US has a long-term plan to win the competition. For example, there's a no difference the China policy between the Republicans and the Democrats in the government. Barack Obama administration started to uh, rebalance the US military force away from Europe or Middle East towards Asia or Indo-Pacific. Since then, the both Trump administration and Biden administration have constituted this policy. The so-called high-tech war was the policy of the Trump administration, we believe. Many people believe this is Trump administration policy, but indeed the high-tech war, which banned the products from the Huawei and ZTE, started when the investigation report on the US national security issues caused by Chinese telecommunication companies, Huawei and ZTE. Uh, that is the starting point. So this means that this is the policy of the Obama administration. After the Trump administration, Biden administration continued this policy. So this means that uh, both Republican and Democrats share the same policy toward China. And recently, the June, June 2021, the US and the UK concluded a new Atlantic Charter. Atlantic Charter, we can remember. The former Atlantic Charter of 1941 announced the set of the common priority, well, common principles indicates the purpose of World War II and the kind of post war world and the two powers wanted to create. So, therefore, renewing the Atlantic Charter indicates that US is codifying the purpose of the competition with China. Indeed, uh, the history of the United States indicates that US will win the competition with China. During its 245 years history, the US has taken only 169 years to transform from a single colony of the British Empire into the world's only superpower, and it has maintained this status for 76 years. During this time, all rivals of the United States, including Germany, Japan, yes, I'm, I'm speaking from Tokyo now, but Germany, Japan, and Soviet Union disappeared. And indeed, the US has a long term plan to win the competition. For example, the before the World War II, the US had the orange plan to defeat Japan and implemented it. But when the plan was declassified in 1974, the world was surprised. Why? Because, uh, because they know that there were also other plans, including the red plan, to defeat Britain and Canada. So the US has prepared for the, any type of con uh, contingency. So if President Biden says that China is its most serious competitor, it is natural to conclude that the US has a plan to defeat China. So uh, I should conclude this, my presentation. The US is still stronger than China and the US has many more allies and the US has a plan to win the competition. Even if the US face a serious situation in the short term, in the long term, the result will remain the same. The age of democracy will come again and again. That's my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Matsuko, for your insight and uh, uh, telling us about the data and stats between the competition of US and China. Uh, thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Yingui. Uh, Dr. Yingui, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yingdu. Hi. Hey, uh, good evening, all. So, uh, what I'm going to focus uh, um, in this presentation is, of course, look at the um, situations of the democracy 
in um, Southeast Asia. So recently, um, just in uh, last October, uh, we uh, have done um, a big project on this um, democracy and human rights in uh, um, Asia and the Africa that uh, whereby we're trying to compare, do comparison studies of the futures of uh, democracy under the umbrella of the sustainable development uh, goals. So what I'm going to do uh, today is to provide a little bit of uh, um, insight uh, by focusing on the democracy and human rights, press freedom and a civic space that I deem as uh, very important in this region, uh, especially when we talk about um, uh, democracies. So um, the uh, democracy index by the uh, um, Economist Intelligence Unit is being used as the benchmark uh, for us to look at the democracy level of the 11 Southeast Asian uh, countries here. So um, what we really found in uh, most of the index is that um, it's very interesting that um, Brunei and uh, Singapore, uh, the two uh, richest countries in the region, always have uh, doubtful uh, data or almost no data, especially for uh, Brunei. And um, so according to the EIU Democracy Index, uh, we have the Timor-Leste, which is one of the most poorest countries here in the Southeast Asia, as uh, uh, that uh, is being high uh, rank uh, as the uh, democratic um, countries. So this, uh, uh, from this index, is really sent a very mixed record of how we actually view um, the uh, democracies here in this region, because uh, democracy is not being um, uh, looked at from all these index uh, in a more in a comprehensive way, whereby uh, civil and political rights continues to receive um, uh, more emphasis, in which it shows the uh, Western model of democracy that is being imposed here. But unfortunately, um, this side of the uh, um, perceptions has sent uh, quite an alarming trend here where if we look at the countries such as uh, Timor, let's say the developmental rights from the perspective of the human rights uh, is um, negatively uh, impacted. So we check on uh, uh, patterns and trends of uh, actually from 2016 to 2020, looking at the data. So just now uh, uh, Mimi was mentioning about the uh, my country, uh, Malaysia. So you know, um, I, I'm sure that uh, everyone is aware with the uh, peaceful regime change in 2018 here in Malaysia. So Malaysia is the only country with a progressing trend when we uh, look at the um, EIU um, index. So it experiences improvement in its democracy uh, after the 2018. But then now that uh, uh, we have changed uh, basically our third prime minister within from 2018 until now, 2022. So, but this is also a sign where when we're talking about democratic transition is never uh, uh, smooth, but these kind of changes has our, however, some sort of backfire on one point that the uh, uh, that actually decrease the people trust on democracy. But on one point, uh, the other point is that the positive trend that we see is the youth. Yeah. So in fact, uh, today, later on, uh, today, uh, um, we're going to have a protest uh, in uh, Kuala Lumpur, in the capital cities. And uh, what happened was that uh, just uh, two days ago and yesterday, the police has uh, announced for close, closures of the road road closures, and also they also closed down some of the public transports to, uh, so to not allow the uh, protest to, to um, go on. So one of the reasons that they are using is the COVID-19. Yeah, so uh, the COVID-19 is being used not only in the context of Malaysia here, but uh, cutting across all the regions as well, especially when protests were still uh, uh, going on in many of the countries such as uh, Myanmar, um, Thailand, and so forth and as well as the Indonesia. So COVID-19 uh, in this region is definitely being used as one of the excuses, especially for countries that are uh, not de fully democratic as one of the uh, justifications of um, why uh, certain of freedom of movements must be curbed. So uh, overall, uh, if we look at, I think press freedoms, uh, uh, the reason why I would like to also talk about this because um, press freedom 
um, is very important in this context in uh, Southeast Asia, because uh, when we talk about democracy, we have to talk about the press freedom as well. So for the press freedom index, we're using the um, RSF index from also 2016 to 2020. So apart from Timor Leste again, the, <clears throat> the rank for the other 10 countries uh, uh, do not show any improved uh, trend. So we are seeing this mismatch of, um, hence it's, it sets, uh, um, how to say, um, uh, the trend where we are putting the Southeast Asia under the US versus China competition. While the scholars are saying one thing, but the public really do not see the same thing as how we are seeing, especially in the, um, under the umbrella of the uh, democracies. So the other next uh, elements that I would like to highlight here very quickly is a civic space. So civic space is again, uh, something that we have to look at in the context of Southeast Asia, because as I use the uh, um, Malaysia's example, protest, although we have peaceful assembly act here, but protest is still not being facilitated by the authorities. So there are still many uh, uh, reasons for them uh, to actually say that protest shouldn't be held and things like that. So, on the uh, data for the civic space, we use a Civicus uh, civic space monitor that uh, basically if we look at the 11 countries here, um, although there's no country that actually fall under the worst category as in narrow, but there's no country that are fall under the best category as well as in open. So all the 11 countries here are either obstructed, repressed or closed. So by combining the three democracy index, um, uh, press freedoms and the civic space, this really uh, send an alarming uh, um, um, signals in the context of the Southeast Asia, especially if I bring in the regional organization that is ASEAN into this picture. This year, we have Cambodia as the ASEAN chair. So there have been already uh, a lot of uh, uh, worries coming from the civil societies about ASEAN, where especially Hun Sen is the very first um, leader who actually visit uh, Myanmar just recently. That uh, so I would say the, the future of democracy here is is rather concerning because ASEAN plays a very important um, role here. So I will conclude it by saying that um, I think um, looking at it from the um, COVID nineteen times that we are having, in which we cannot dismiss or ignore the impact of COVID nineteen on democracies here. The COVID-19 really teaches us that the correlations between the economy and the perceptions of uh, democracy cannot be um, ignored because there's a lot to talk about civil political rights, but economy is really something that the bread and butters that the public are really talking about. And democracy, unfortunately, does not really deliver that by our leaders here. So I think uh, I will end this where um, I must say this has indeed posed an enormous challenge for the pro-democracy and human rights group here in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yingui, for your discussion and for your detailed research about the ASEAN countries. And uh, of course, you touched base uh, the, every country in the region and uh, telling us about the, how the pandemic changed the situation and uh, how the democracy is not deliverable due to this one uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, and what's the reality behind that? That uh, if the leaders are taking this pandemic as an excuse of not delivering or it's, it's a real impact on economy and, and uh, our sustainable development goals. Mm, thank you. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Saroka uh, for his presentation. Dr. Saroka, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Indu. Um, so my background is as a Russianist. I, I'm a little bit like a fish out of water here in this distinguished group today. Uh, Russia, I, I think, can be considered in the Indo-Pacific group, but I'm really hanging on by my teeth here. So what I'd like to do, um, because I, I don't know that much specifically about Asia, uh, would be to take a more theoretical focus and reflect on some of the trends I've seen uh, both in the post-communist world and also uh, with my studies of comparative democratization more generally, this is more like the 30,000 foot overview. I'm happy though, if anyone has questions about Russia or any of the post-communist countries to get into more detail. So first, let me begin by saying that I don't think we actually have a crisis of democracy on our hands in the world today, but we have rather a crisis of liberalism. I think that we in the West often forget the adjective liberal when we discuss what democracy means for us. And 
you know, for decades, we, and by we, I mean academics, pundits, politicians, we've been looking at survey data from other parts of the world, let's say the Middle East or South Asia. And in all of these cases, we've been seeing that pluralities or even majorities of people report wanting and supporting democracy. And our response to that has been congratulatory, self-congratulatory. We've patted ourselves on the back and we've said, well, the third wave of democratization is progressing. But the reality is that in many parts of the world, including in the West, mind you, while people do indeed want democracy, they want rights and protections for themselves, but not necessarily for others. They also want democracy because they think it'll bring them economic prosperity. And this makes sense, right? When you have a responsive political system, businesses tend to be easier to open, officials tend to be less corrupt, and contracts tend to be enforced. But I want to suggest to you that this is actually a far cry from a liberal version of democracy where followers of unpopular religions have their rights protected uh, or where ethnic minorities feel safe or where women are treated as fully equal to men or where, where the uh, LGBTQ community um, is respected and, and visible. In other words, what I've described is a majoritarian or an illiberal version of democracy that plays very well in populist political appeals. And from these populist political appeals, it's a very slippery slope to competitive authoritarian and other forms of hybrid regimes. This is something we've seen clearly in post-communist Europe playing out over the course of the last two decades. Um, people in many countries, post-communist European countries and elsewhere, overwhelmingly want to be able to vote for their rulers. They just don't want the votes of smaller, less popular groups to count as much as their own votes do. And this is exactly the sort of majoritarian democracy we're seeing today in Hungary or Poland. Now, second, for all that I'm well aware that Western democracy is under a concerted attack uh, from external forces, whether these be Russian troll farms or uh, paid Chinese bloggers that are uh, sent out to sow disinformation, I want to suggest to you that the number one threat to liberal democracy comes from within. Uh, it comes with apathy and it comes with disillusionment in the democratic promise. And here, the disparities are often generational. Um, it, you know, in the United States, if you ask the silent generation, so basically we're talking about people born between 1928 and 1945, whether it's absolutely imperative to live in a democracy, the overwhelming majority, over 70%, will reply with a resounding yes. If you ask millennials, and this is not even the youngest generation now, right? These guys and gals are aging fast. Some of them are already well into middle age. The same question, fewer than half, will give you the same answer. This is absolutely striking. And a lot of theories have been advanced as to why this might be the case. And I personally think that at least in the United States and in Western Europe, the economic performance theory holds the most water. So this, this kind of dovetails with some comments that have already been made by the other presenters. Basically, you know, we can go back, we can look at the data for the world as a whole, right up until the 1970s. When countries democratized, this was generally followed by a period of improved economic performance and the expansion of the middle class, which is the bulwark as anyone who studies comparative democratization knows, is the bulwark of democracy. However, beginning in the 1980s or so, this connection came into question. This was partly the result of neoliberalism and deregulation being promoted by Reagan in the US and Thatcher in the UK. Um, as a result of these policies, the middle class stagnated across much of the Western world in real wage inflation adjusted terms, but it also resulted from the booming economic growth of what at the time were non-democratic countries in Asia. First, the so-called NICs or East Asian Tigers, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, and later Communist China and others. And I can't tell you how many students in my classes have made over the years the argument that authoritarianism is good for economic development immediately after I teach on East Asia, immediately after we look at East Asia, without realizing that the NICs developed under very specific conditions and in a unique global context. And I always tell them to be careful in making such arguments because in looking for Singapore, it's really easy to instead end up in the Sudan. Now, at the same time, I think as a student of democracy, we may be expecting too much of recent democratization 
in particular, we have to look at the historical example. Sherry Berman pointed this out beautifully in a Journal of Democracy piece some years ago. The history of democratization in Europe was bloody and it was fraught with reverses. Put differently, why in the world did we expect we would have smooth sailing in Poland or Hungary? But while there's a lot of evidence following Robert Dahl that the surest path to a stable consolidated democracy is that of liberalism preceding inclusion, this is a model that for obvious reasons is not feasible to follow anymore. How, how do you tell democracy activists in Russia or in China, your society just isn't ready for democracy, wait have deep conversations, wait a few decades, maybe a few centuries, you'll get there eventually. This isn't going to fly. So democratizers are left to counter liberal and anti-democratic societal tendencies with institutional design. But this doesn't always work out so well. And I'll give you one example from my neck of the woods. The European Commission triggered Article 7 proceedings against Poland, which would eventually result in the kicking out of Poland from the European Union for violating judicial independence in December 2017. So as I just mentioned, taken to its conclusion, this would have resulted in the country being expelled from the EU. But the final stage of this process requires a unanimous vote of the EU member states. At the time, it was still 28. And as soon as Article 7 was triggered, Hungary came out and declared that it would never vote to boot Poland. This was. I'm suggesting to you a profound failure of imagination on the part of EU bureaucrats who crafted these institutions. And it was also more than a little bit of hubris. Few thought that once former communist countries became democratic, they could possibly ever revert to anything else. You know, and I, I noticed no, no one touched on this, although um, Dr. Indu broached this with us when, when we were invited. So I'll, I'll just quickly say a few words about this. It's not about poor institutional design or democratic fatigue, I think. I, I think the current situation democracy finds itself in also results from feckless subversion of democratic institutions for political game. And this, this is exactly what we saw on January 6, 2020 in Washington, DC. Uh, take a look at the video of that day. Whatever I think of their politics, I do think most of those people gathered around the Capitol were sincere in their beliefs. They literally believed that the election had been stolen and that they were doing the bidding of their commander in chief. How did we get to such a place that basic facts, facts, not just their interpretation, were and are being questioned? Um, you know, Surely I think the stress and anxiety of the pandemic had something to do with it, but information was polarized, weaponized, in 2020, like it had never before been, at least to my knowledge, in a free society. Yes, social media certainly played a role, but social media does not post itself. And this is the big question, I think, of our day. This is the big question of our generation. This is something we're going to have to grapple to understand. How did it come to this in the places we thought were nice, stable democracies? Not, not places that had democratized 20, 30 years ago, but places that have been democratic for decades, if not centuries, that the very foundations of democracy were being questioned. Uh, you know, emblematic of this in my mind are the comments of uh, Congressman Andrew Clyde, who in May of last year said the rioters reminded him of, and I'm quoting, normal tourists visiting the Capitol. Uh, this is the same man we saw in photos of January 6th barricading the door to the House chamber with a look of absolute terror on his face. So the question is not just about definitions. The question at hand is not just about institutions. The question at hand is about the very ways in which we value and understand and communicate what it means to be democratic. Um, I'll stop right there, but I'd be very happy to also take some questions about what this means for the US's role in the world at large and in promoting democracy, if the audience has any. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Soroka, for your nice and wonderful presentation. Of course, I echo with your comments, like uh, it's the, the crisis comes within the apathy, disillusionment, and uh, we are not respecting the values like when uh, Sometimes I see the philosophy in Gandhi, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, and Nelson Mandela. Sometimes, like the when Ruskin bombs, uh, 
that unto the last. So what's that meaning? Like uh, we, if we are uh, serving and we are having the political elites around us and they are lobbying everything, that's, that's the real crisis of uh, uh, democracy or uh, we say liberalism. Thank you so much. Now I would like to invite uh, Director of the Consortium, Dr. Ernest Gunasekra Rockwell, uh, for his comments. Doc, over to you. Uh, and you know, I never like to get uh, in, into all of this and everything. That the, the folks are here to, to to listen to these experts that we've brought in. But uh, I do want to thank everyone for their opening comments. Uh, and uh, I, I think you know it was, it's great because you've brought together people who have you know vastly different experience within the region. And, and Dr. Soroka, I, I definitely believe that you know, you know your expertise in in Russia and uh, in, in in theory uh, contributes significantly to the conversation that we're having today. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Indu, for for the, uh, the the question and answers, and uh, I encourage the audience to ask your questions in the chat box so that we can keep the conversation rolling. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, let me start with the, our first question from the chat box, uh, rather than uh, taking my question first. Uh, so it's uh, from Mike D. Abramo and. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, does our notion of American exceptionalism impede our ability to critique the weakness of our own political system? So um, maybe I would like to invite Dr. Soroko to uh, uh, just uh, to tell a brief about this. Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I, I'm a Russianist by training, but I am an, an, an American by citizenship. So I, I feel at least partly competent to answer this. Um, you know, I, I think every nation at some point in its history has had a sense of itself as exceptional, uh, as having a, a specific mission in the world, uh, often divinely inspired or, or to some other end. Uh, having said that, um, I do think that in the United States, simply because of our success over the last few decades, um, we've been myopic in how we see the rest of the world. So I, I would, I think, agree with the statement that our exceptionalism, meaning this idea that um, we are a beacon unto nations. I mean, th these ideas go back well before the founding of the United States, this idea of the city on the hill that, that, that they actually have antecedents in, in uh, Puritan theology and, and kind of the writings of John Winthrop and other interesting early figures in colonial America. But um, I, I do think it blinds us to problems in the world uh, that we should be seeing. And I, I think the rest of the world really picks up on what they sense is a lot of American hypocrisy. Because in other words, we, we seem to talk a good game about democracy, but uh, rightly or wrongly, a lot of the rest of the world sees us pursuing our hard power interests when push comes to shove. So um, I, I, I have some more thoughts on that, but I don't want to monopolize the conversation. So maybe someone else would like to chime in. Uh, sure, sure. Thank you, Dr. Saraka, for your comments. Uh, Dr. Baird, uh, you want to say something? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, you know, go back to what uh, Dr. Saraka said about um, the economic performance theory and the also uh, disillusionment. You know, um, it, it specifically you talk about United States. You know, I'm also an American, and and looking at it, I, I have been uh, uh, watching, you know, rising inequality, rising inequality in in, in United States. And I used to teach that in my classes to the military personnel. And I used to get, <laughs> I used to get hammer. People are saying that I was being uh, more, uh, communist or something like that when I was criticizing and that exceptionalism a little bit, right? It, it couldn't possibly happen here, but I would just say, no, based on all this study that has done, right? That um, the uh, rising inequality as the inequality index, Gini index goes up, I was sounding alarm and uh, you know nobody ever believe it. And, and, and so January 6th, what happened in January 6th is almost a textbook case of uh, inequality and instability. You know, uh, we have seen that. So, um, you know, I, I, I started uh, tracking because I was working for Pacific Command Headquarters back in 2004 as a deputy economic advisor. And we were tracking all kinds of um, uh, economic indicators that could uh, turn into instability. So that's when I started tracking um, 
the the inequality index around the you know around the uh, Indo-Pacific as a, a leading indicator, uh, you know, for for us to pay attention to. So, but I never well, I I I I hope that it didn't happen in the United States, but all the indicators were there. So it was not, um, is, you know, and, and again, back to what you were saying, the elite capture of the system, right? So they, they started to change the policies, influence the policy that continued to advantage the certain, you know, the elite class of people. While they, as a re result, you know, the, 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 um, the middle class stagnated and then inequality widens, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's a textbook case. I'm, I'm not saying anything new. I'm just saying, applying that, what the, the scholars in inequality like uh, Krugman and the, um, uh, 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 Stiglitz has said, you know, so. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Dr. Briggs. Now, uh, my uh, question goes to uh, Dr. Nagao. There, Rising number of military coups and overturning the elected government in recent years has been rotating. Just in 2021, from Myanmar, Sudan, Mali, uh, Guinea, Conquery, Afghanistan, likewise, the rise of authoritarianism and populist leaders are among the utmost concern for global democracy. Is it the class of democracy, democracy versus authoritarianism in the era of great power conflict? Yeah, thank you very much for asking. Yes, that's why US must win the competition with China. That's the answer of mine. Is this too short? Yeah, thank you. So now, Dr. Bid, I want to take your insight on this. It's, it's a democracy versus authoritarianism uh, or, or what it is. When, when we see the coup in Myanmar and Sudan and Mali, so, uh, what, what do you take over this? Uh, Myanmar specifically, I can comment on that. I'm not very familiar with the other countries as much, you know. Um, uh, the, with Myanmar, of course, uh, you know, Myanmar democracy was in transition, right? It was a, a it was a, a new uh, 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 infancy, it, it, democracy at an infancy level. And we know from all the studies, you know, all the scholar has said, you know, the young democracy is one of the most unstable democracy, you know, and, and so uh, it is not, uh, and, and then also a uh, J-curve, you know, I, I, I love Ian Bremer's J-curve, right? It's always easier to go back up to the short end of the J-curve than make that uh, institutional uh, uh, um, uh, changes and improvement to, you know, make the curve and go up the higher uh, uh, portion of the J. So, um, you know, again, in a way, uh, what happened in Myanmar is, 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 is also almost predictable. Uh, we hope it wasn't, but also um, in many ways, uh, all uh, the, the, the Western countries, the, the democracy did not take the um, opportunities. You know, it was there to help, you know, these young democracy make that transition, to make that curve, you know, turn the curve at the bottom. So um, I think it was an opportunity missed, um, but also it is kind of almost predictable using uh, Ian Bremer's, you know, J-curve. Thanks, Dr. Big. Like uh, when I see that there is a big fish, like China is over there behind the, in the backyard of the Myanmar. So like, it's very difficult to, to take the other smaller Asian nations to take the steps to, toward that. That's why we are seeing the ASEAN's role. So my next question to uh, Dr. Yingui, how do you see ASEAN's role as an effective regional organization after almost one year of military coup in Myanmar? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Indu. I would just like to uh, also comment a little bit on the previous questions that has the linkage with these questions on the ASEAN. Uh, in the issues of Myanmar is that now that we see uh, if we're talking about either you want to talk about democracy, authoritarianism and so forth, but looking at this uh, region, I think uh, one of the issues that we can bring in is the democratic assistance provided by, uh, for example, from the US, from the EU and so forth, that is uh, uh, quite a huge amount in this uh, region. But what's missing is really that 
if we look at the uh, Chinese assistance, it is for infrastructures. For instance, in the country such as Timor Leste uh, and so forth. So they build infrastructures that the, the people think they need it more than to tell them that, you know, uh, to give the money to the civil society that you host a demo democracy program. So I will say that I think there is a need to change the strategies of the democratic assistance to really understand the sentiments in the region, because that for me is really set a backfire on the uh, notions of democracies, because it, it has, I think that creates the distrust on that, you know, people will be questioning why is you as giving all this kind of democratic assistance where this is not our bread and butter. We need other things that should come to us immediately that we can actually uh, use it. So now I bring it to the conversations of the ASEAN um, is that, as I mentioned just now, with uh, this year, the uh, Cambodia as the ASEAN chair, I must say it is going to be a very difficult year here. But what's interesting is Cambodia, as we know, with the, uh, with, with the back by um, China, with the influence that is really strong in that region and with almost no oppositions in that country because the Cambodian National Rescue Party is basically disbanded already and the politicians are all in a political exile and they are unable to return back. So in that kind of a con uh, uh, condition, how would then ASEAN uh, be able to perform? But um, Hun Sen's visit to Myanmar is definitely a wrong start if we really want to talk about democracies and open space and that kind of things. And uh, I think uh, the ASEAN actually has already adopted this five-point consensus on the Myanmar crisis. So this is one of the very first time that ASEAN actually do something about uh, uh, the, the crisis here. But unfortunately, um, it did a, it, it take off a, quite okay. But now I think the, the ASEAN uh, chairmanship with the Cambodia, I, I, I think it is kind of like send a signal that perhaps the issues of the Myanmar uh, might be a long way for us to actually resolve. And it is not only Myanmar that having the issues here, because I think there's a lot of focus on talking about Myanmar. But there's a lot of issues in Cambodia, Philippines, Thailand, and many other countries that also deserve the equal attention in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Indu, I think you are unmute. You have to unmute. Yeah, sure. Dr. Yingkui, thank you so much. And Dr. Nagao, would you like to say something on this question? Uh, the, sorry, could you repeat? Uh, could you please repeat the question? Uh, during, sorry, I'm reading the chat box just now. Uh, but, sure, sorry. I will take the question. Like there is one question uh, in the chat box for you. Uh, uh, that's from Leo. This, he's a consortium ah, okay. member. Uh, I, I just read just the question. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, when we compare uh, power uh, between the US and China, of course, I should explain. Military, uh, of course, I have already explained. The simply indicate that the US military expenditure is three times higher than China's. And uh, politically, yes, uh, uh, many U.S. citizens worry about the image of the United States after the incident in the capital. That's true. But you from Japanese, U.S. is still leader of the democracy. Uh, in this, uh, I want to inform the American uh, voters, uh, citizens, uh, don't worry about this because, uh, because such incident has happened in many places in the world. This is accident, just accident, view uh, from us. So this incident indicates uh, us, ah, U.S. is uh, a common country like us, uh, but still, U.S. is a powerful, number one uh, powerful country and the uh, leading country of the democracy. So, for if the, uh, if the American people worry about the image of the United States, yes, damaged, but not so. That is uh, what I want to say. This is just an accident for us, uh, for Japanese. And the uh, economic aspect, yes, uh, UK think tank indicates that uh, China is catching up. That's true. Indeed, the China is economic threat compared with Russia. Russia, when we check the uh, tendency of China's uh, uh, territory expansion, 
uh, for example, they're in South China Sea. They steal the territory. Steal territory, the, who, who, what I want to say is, Russia is a burger, but China is thief. Uh, why? Because uh, when the you, uh, France, France withdraw from the Vietnam or Indochina Peninsula, uh, China take half of the Paracel Island in 1950s. And in the 1970s, when the United States withdraw from Vietnam, uh, China takes uh, another half of the Paracel Island. And in 1980s, when Soviet troops withdraw from Vietnam, no, not withdraw, but uh, reducing the number uh, of the troops in the Vietnam, uh, Ch China takes uh, six feet of the Spratory Island. In 1990s, 1990s uh, when the US withdraw from Philippines, China uh, takes a mischief reef. So when we check the China's uh, pattern of the territory expansion, they are safe. When they find the power vacuum, they steal it. But the Russian's case is different. R case of Russia, when they find a chance, they use the military and fight uh, against a uh, weaker country and take it. So a little different. Uh, Russia is Bagara and China is safe. So view from this, uh, um, how to deter China is, uh, if we maintain the military balance, do not create a power vacuum, we can deter the China's military activity. This is uh, different with the case of Russia. So that's why China's threat is economical threat, I want to say. Uh, China's threat is military threat, of course, but the economical uh, aspect is more bigger. China, have, China is rich. China is a rich country. That is the reason uh, they modernize their military so rapid pace. And, uh, uh, start, uh, Belt and Road Initiative depends on the ample uh, budget of China. That's why the China expands their influence. Uh, that's why the economy is very important. That's why U.S. focusing on economic security now. And uh, U.S. allies, including Japan, also focusing on the economic security now. Uh, so that's why economy is very important. But uh, still, the military, political economy, still U.S. is stronger than China. So when we check the power, of course, uh, US will win, I believe. And uh, this question focusing on the, another aspect uh, for Japan, the whole South Korea, yes. Um, when we check the uh, economical side, uh, yes, China is catching up the United States. And the military, uh, of course, uh, China is catching up the United States. In this case, what is the role of the US allies? Uh, allies should share the security burden with the United States and uh, try to create a uh, network-based security system. For a long time, uh, Japan depend on the hub and spoke system in uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, based on the bilateral line between the US and Japan, US and South Korea, US and the Philippines, US and Thailand, US and Australia. But uh, Japan and Australia are not, uh, are not allies. Uh, Japan and South Korea are not allies. Uh, but now, these allies should cooperate each other and share security burden. That's a new model, not hub and spoke. Now the network-based security system. So this is a role for the Japan, South Korea, and both uh, politically and economy, uh, military, eco political economy. Uh, so uh, that's my answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nagao, for your um, answer. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is uh, from Dr. Achla Gunasekra Rockwell. Uh, how can democracies help nations like Sri Lanka cling to its own democracy when its leaders are handling are handing over sovereignty to authoritarian states like China or Russia through debt trap lending, wolf warrior diplomacy, or military aggression? So, I would like to say this question: like that uh, question is uh, attached to Dr. Ying, who is uh, answered that she. Uh, did in the uh, first questions, uh, the previous questions, uh, that it's uh, providing the infrastructure. It's the debt trap policy or the wolf warrior policy of China that is providing the infrastructure to uh, um, uh, smaller South Asian nations or other African nations. So uh, I would like to take your comments, uh, Yingui, first, then I will go to the next speakers. Uh, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Indu. I think uh, I've answered basically about that question so when I uh, uh, compare the US uh, assistance and also the assistance coming from um, China as well, uh, although it is not really fall under the umbrella of uh, so-called foreign aid structures that we are talking about, but we definitely see 
um, there's uh, so much of uh, surveys and studies are being done to compare uh, whether US will win in this region or the China will win in these regions. But of course, there are also studies that are talking about um, we should not dismiss also the role of uh, um, EU, um, Japan, and uh, many others uh, powers in this uh, region as well. But I will say that uh, if it is based on uh, some of my studies, especially in the context of um, Timor-Leste, I will definitely say it's uh, uh, rather concerning uh, when, when we see the assistance coming uh, from uh, different uh, organizations because uh, I would like to bring the attention to my uh, earliest point about developmental issues that is uh, highly being ignored because uh, many of the assistance comes in uh, you know stage by stage but there's no uh, consistencies especially uh, as well as uh, I think it also open up for um, the um, um, how to say, if I use uh, another example from Myanmar or Cambodia. So uh, I also done research about the human rights education in Southeast Asia. But what's very interesting is that, you know, uh, human rights is not really, uh, um, it is continue to be a sensitive words here. But then uh, we will see uh, there's assistance um, uh, provided to Myan Myanmar governments, Cambodian governments to actually develop a curriculum on human rights education, but this does not really translate into the, the practice uh, approach. So what's really missing here and what has gone wrong is really something that we have to analyze it. Uh, things that while there are huge assistance going into democracy and human rights, but it does not translate into the practical uh, approach in terms of how it is being implemented. So definitely, I will say it is not only just a missed opportunity, but I think the money is being not being used in a full uh, way in this. Thank you. I want to um, quickly uh, 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 compliment what uh, Dr. Yin said on the, yes, human right training were done for the, uh, for the victims. The, the most of the training went to the victims, not to the perpetrators. They were not teaching at the national defense colleges. They're not teaching that concept. So we were we refused to engage with the, you know, in Myanmar particularly, I, I can tell you because I observe at the very at the ground level. So when they were giving, you know, training and education and all that human rights training, it was going to the victims not to the perpetrator. So because perpetrator, we said we can't engage with them. So we really did not engage with the military. And, and but we were able to engage some level with the police. And as a result of that education, we see huge defection from the police from the beginning of the coup when they started to see. So many times what you're seeing sometimes on the street wearing police uniform and you know shooting uh, 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 an armed citizen in the head is not really the police, it's the military in police uniform. And, and back to what I was saying, we lost the opportunity in that 10 years of Myanmar, uh, transition to democracy was that we did not engage with the perpetrator and, and, and you know do that training. So I think it's kind of, yeah, I know it is yucky. You know, it's not, uh, these are perpetrators and we don't want to, but, you know, if we want to change their mind and see it differently, I think we have to engage with that, right? But we didn't do that. So just to, just to um, follow up on Dr. Ying. Thank comment. you, Dr. Bid, and thank you, Dr. Ying. We, uh, I would be happy if uh, other speakers also want to say something on this. I, I will uh, move on to the next questions. Uh, so this next question is uh, uh, from Dr. Hayat Alvi. Uh, uh, I like she's saying that she is very alarmed with the erosion of democracy in India and the statings of genocidal language, attitudes, and acts that risk the potential for expanding in the country. What can be done to recalibrate India back in the democracy? And what can Western powers do about this? Uh, who wants to go first from the speakers? Something about uh, the uh, most populous democracy of the world. Oh, 
Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I have the enough knowledge. I, I'm not a, you know, South Asian specialist, but uh, it, we can, the erosion of democracy in India can also be seen in regards to current, uh, its lack of support for, you know, the, the restoring democracy movement in Myanmar, right? In the past, India was always a, a very reliable partner for the, you know, Myanmar uh, democracy movement. I mean, many of the Indian uh, 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 prime ministers and, you know, they were a friend of Duang San Suu Kyi in the past, supported her fully, but in this particular incident, it's no longer there. It's, it is a one of the my, a few a handful of countries that are supporting the military regime, and that right now is China is a part of that small club. I mean, no, I'm sorry, India is a part of that small club. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Uh, Dr. Nagao. I would definitely would like to take your comments on this. Uh, something that you have expertise on India's uh, security aspect. Yeah, this is the issue of the domestic politics in India, and uh, I'm researcher of the defense and security originally. But uh, yes, uh, some uh, expert pointed out the same thing indeed. But at the same time, the compare with China, the India is free world, I think. So, how to define the democracy, uh, and uh, how um, how to share the value with India? Uh, India has a very high price. If the democratic country uh, uh, recommend something to India, uh, it, it looks like from high to down, uh, maybe India will resist very strongly and uh, it will harm the India's pride. So, but as a friend, uh, maybe we should uh, share the uh, experience related to democracy one by one. Maybe we can do it, I think. And uh, in this case, uh, in some case, uh, yes, uh, especially the opposition party in uh, India blamed the uh, current government uh, about this issue uh, repeatedly. So uh, sometimes uh, maybe Indian government should res uh, respect uh, this uh, opinion of this opposition, that's true. But at the same time, the India is still uh, part of the free world, I believe. Uh, that is the reason the India is a very important partner for us. And, uh, Mm. We should see the good part of India uh, uh, when we find something problem in India. That's uh, my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Nagao. The next, my next question is from the chat box and is uh, for Dr. Saroka. Uh, a crisis of liberalism is an excellent frame. Could you dive further into different challenges for political institutions versus the political culture, norms, or values? and their navigation by a society? Yeah, uh, well, if, if I, it's a great question, but if I dove into all that, we'd be here for the rest of the, uh, for the, rest of the evening. Uh, let me just say, before I, I attempt to give an answer to that, um, I, I don't think I gave a good answer to the first question because I didn't read the whole thing. Uh, I read too quickly. The, the question that was posed about American exceptionalism and being able to critique our own institutions, and I'll, I'll show how this connects to the present question in a moment, but. I, I think there really is something to this because we regard ourselves um, as exceptional in the sense that we have been the victims of our own success. As I said, we think of ourselves as the paragon of democracy and we don't look at the small erosions of, um, you, you may guess by now I'm institutionalist, but of institutional structures in the United States. So I'm thinking of things like uh, the Supreme Court increasingly hearing uh, cases through shadow dockets. Uh, I'm thinking of things like the increase in executive orders, which actually really took off under uh, President Barack Obama, uh, th that are really challenging this division of, this tripart division of separation of powers. Uh, yes, so I, I do think we are blinded by our exceptionalism not to look critically at our own institutions. In terms of the wider question, you know, institutions are, easy to subvert if, if you don't have a political culture that values them. So, so this is, I think, a good frame for beginning this discussion of liberalism. Um, some years ago, I, I think the last uh, volume came out, the last edition came out maybe a decade or so, I think 2010, but don't hold me to it. Uh, there was a book called Culture War Question Mark, The Myth of a Polarized America. It was put out by uh, Mo Fiorina at Stanford University. 
Uh, and there the premise was that America as a whole was not deeply divided, but what we as the masses were being fed was deeply divisive. And what I mean by this is that the elite were deeply divided, but the population wasn't. I don't think we can say that any longer. I, I've stopped using this book in my courses some, some years ago. Um, but what I'm getting at is, I think if we're looking at this question about liberalism and we're thinking about political culture or institutions, I, I think the answer here in the American case goes back into the 1970s with changes in how our primary system was being structured, uh, with changes in how um, politicians related to one another across parties. It's, it's really striking. If you look at the evidence, um, voting across the aisle has gone down tremendously in the last 50 years. Uh, even something as seemingly innocuous as how often do Democrats have lunch with Republicans? I'm talking about Congress people. That has dropped off significantly. Uh, we have surveys of this, believe it or not, in, in the last uh, few decades. So I, I think a lot of the impetus from this is very much from a top-down direction, but I don't want to entirely um, ignore the fact that there is also a mass level phenomenon to this. And I think partly the crisis of liberalism uh, stems from the fact that we've entered an information age that's unprecedented in history. Not only are we in information cycles that are 24 seven, but editorial control has been removed, right? Before, if you wanted information, you read something an editor looked at that got approved to be published in a newspaper. Uh, you looked at something that uh, met the FCC rule uh, that was known as the Fairness Doctrine. This was repealed in 1988. That no longer is in place. Um, so the result of this, I think, on the mass level is that the goalposts are moving very, very quickly. And for many people, this is incredibly difficult to, to adjust to. Um, and I have to say, you know, quite frankly, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, to some of the uh, existential anxieties I think people are having over dealing with issues that they never had to deal with before at, at a breakneck speed on, on both sides, by the way, of the political aisle. Um, I realize that's probably not a satisfactory answer to a great and very complicated question, but I think that's unfortunately all I have time to delve into right now. Thank you, Dr. Saroka, for your answer. Thank you so much. And the next question is from uh, Arun Ayagari, and uh, uh, it's again for the Myanmar. Um, how can states like Myanmar, which do not have a good history of uh, relenting to international pressure, be understood? Uh, Dr. Um, Baird? Yeah. Well, current situation is uh, is is different from history a little bit. You know, um, there are some uh, similarity from the uh, commonality with the the historical you know experience, but also again back to Dr. Uh, Soroka was saying about. Uh, in information technology, right? Information ICT. So the opposition side, the people side, is is able to utilize all that to come together to cooperate and coordinate their action, it, it, which in the past was not possible. But also, um, you know, uh, uh, there are three. When looking at the all the uh, revolution that are successful, according to the you know the, the scholar, what they found was that it has three common elements. Uh, a condition in it. Number one was the people's anger, majority of the people's anger. And then the second condition was that uh, international pressure. And then the third was the defection, defection by the elite and defection by the military. And so if you utilize those uh, indicators, I mean, those, these are key, there are other elements, but those are the key the three that tend to appear in these successful uh, revolutions. And Myanmar has all of it. In the past, they don't have that people anger type, right? They just, uh, what we can see that it continued, that anger continued to uh, 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 um, stay intact. It, as the Myanmar military become more brutal, people commitment get even, uh, anger and commitment get even like more, more um, uh, 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 higher, right? And what we can see that element in, in, in indicated was in Feb, uh, December 10, they did the nationwide silent strike. The entire country was empty. Nobody came out. Well, 
there were 99 people showed up and they were protesting on behalf of the military. 99 out of 54 million people, right? So that tells you, and then they started uh, banging pots and pans all over again. So that the people anger is still there. And then, like I said, international pressure just today uh, is, is growing every time. Even Hun Sen went in, but today, uh, yesterday, Hun Sen um, uh, issued an, uh, a statement because that, you know, the atrocity continued to happen. So I think that the people are going to start to see the international player when they go in with the good, um, uh, 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 good intent, go and talk to the military, military will continue to do what they do and they ended up getting, you know, uh, black face, right? Losing their face. So Hun Sen is having to uh, issue a statement yesterday. And then this morning, uh, both Total and the Chevron are pulling out of Myanmar, right? So again, another international pressure and the elite uh, and the uh, def uh, defection uh, 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 issue, unprecedented level of military are, and a police has defected. There's a, about 5,000 on record, but there are like more of, you know, defection that they never reported are experiencing. So all of that together, you know, you can look. So in the past, you may have the international pressure. You did not have the other two elements. And this time it has three, all three elements are uh, uh, at present in, in, in current situation. So that's why it may be, it will be, and, and then further, uh, it, it is all the all of that is made possible by improved ICT, and then ten years of opening and the engagement with the women. Uh, Sixty-five percent of the resistance fighters are women, and because in that ten years, all the eight packages that came in always had a women empowerment element, and so now women understand that the polit political and you know all this uh, uh, political arena is re relevant to them. You know, they need to be a part of it, right? And then now they have the capability to be a part of it. So they are leading many in, 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 in many uh, uh, places as well, not only their participant, but also in the leadership position. So all of this put together, it's different from the previous um, experience. Hindu, you're uh, muted. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Bird, for your answer. The next question, I'm taking it from the chat box, uh, and that's for Dr. Ku. Uh, um, you mentioned that the pandemic has been used the has been used by the government in Southeast Asian region as an excuse to control social movement. Since the pandemic would not be ended soon, how do you assess the role of civil society in the future social development in the region? Sure, thank you uh, very much. And uh, thank you, uh, Leo, for the questions. Uh, I would say it's quite interesting that despite of the state uh, uh, repressions, uh, we also witness uh, new, new groups of um, uh, movements and the uh, NGOs increasing in the region at the same time. So we have these tensions of the uh, mobilizations versus the uh, state repression, because when state repression is high, uh, it does not mean that the uh, movements always will die off. But um, um, the question is really about with the increasing numbers, as we observe, uh, the influence uh, comes into questions, whether are they able to actually um, influence the states uh, in terms of uh, uh, their policies and, and things. I think in the Southeast Asia region, um, one of the uh, uh, very important issues is the legislations. All the uh, NGOs and uh, uh, movements here, uh, we have the issues with the uh, strict legislations that actually restrict uh, their operations and their movements. And uh, very interestingly, as uh, actually uh, one of uh, the latest news is that if we look at the um, Southeast Asia, Thailand is uh, basically the NGO hub for the international um, NGOs to operate because it used to be uh, um, having a very friendly environment to allow the uh, NGOs, especially the international NGOs to actually operate and uh, function here. So uh, just um, uh, this week, we see that the... Um, um, 
uh, the aide to the Prime Minister, uh, was actually collecting the per, uh, online campaign to uh, the signatures that he has gathered, the 1 million signatures to expel Amnesty International from uh, Thailand. So this, of course, sent a very alarming uh, signal because in Cambodia, they have already done that. They, uh, did, um, they, they move away the uh, medias and then the international um, uh, NGOs. And uh, if, when we look at the situations in Thailand, where it used to be a popular hub for the international NGOs, which uh, they have uh, roughly about um, 86 of them there, that actually operate in Thailand to allow for the operations of the other NGOs in the uh, Southeast Asia um, region. I think with the COVID-19, um, as I just now mentioned, um, I mean, uh, Malaysia also just uh, today, the protest, they, they use the name of COVID-19. And uh, unfortunately, on some, some uh, uh, perspective, um, the, whether the COVID-19 uh, is the answer where, you know, we should not uh, be uh, having the uh, freedom of movements that opens up the other questions where uh, COVID-19 has lived with us for um, two years. I think that sentiment also has reduced a little bit where the economics are the one that uh, impacted the most. So economic has suffered in this region. So I think uh, what the, uh, the future of the social developments in the region is that uh, there's a disrecognition that economy is very important and how they can bridge it to uh, their work in this region. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ku. The next question is uh, from Kate. How can bigger democracies like US and European countries provide democratic assistance to smaller states? when they themselves are grappling with the challenge of populist politics and the major, majoritarian democracy. Dr. Soroka, would you like to step on? Uh, you are, please unmute. I'm, I'm sorry, I had an errant cough before. Um, I, I can try to address this. I, I mean, I think it's a difficult question. Um, Bigger democracies like the United States and European countries, you know, um, they have conflicting incentives sometimes because ultimately one of the ironies of being a democracy is that you're vulnerable to the whims and vicissitudes of your electorate back home. So, um, you know, the question is, how do you provide effective democracy promotion assistance, but you don't spend so much money or you don't do things that make your electorate at home recall you from office, right? D democracy, you can always vote the rascals out. Um, I, I think the key though, within these limiting parameters that I just outlined, I think the key is to be very targeted about the type of aid that's provided. We have um, research that shows, for example, that uh, aid that is targeted to specific democracy promotion projects or specific economic advancement projects is more effective than more generalized aid. Uh, in terms of grappling with our own problems, I don't see that necessarily as a weakness. I, I see that as a strength. I think it's um, very important to convey to countries that democracy is not a teleological process. It's not a one and done process. Democracies throughout history they wane, they wax in terms of their democratic commitment. So, uh, you know, I, I think arguing by the power of example, even flawed example can be very powerful, but what needs to be done is you need to have real commitment at the elite level. You need to impose good institutions and you need to have very targeted uh, financial exchanges. Thank you, uh, Dr. Soro. Uh, um, for your answer. Uh, Dr. Nagao, would you like to say something on this? Of course, uh, how to define the democracy, maybe US and Europe are more there, that's true. But at the same time, to, indeed, uh, even if the Japanese, we cannot say what is democracy. So there are some variety, I think. So that's uh, reason uh, 
uh, we can include a variety of democracies, but we cannot accept uh, China's type of democracy. They call the, themselves a democratic country, but uh, I don't think so. Uh, that's the uh, answer to China. Uh, is this a proper question, a proper answer for your question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. My next question is for like, uh, is uh, uh, more kind of focus on China's authoritarianism uh, has been increasingly threatening the liberal institutions uh, such as those found in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Myanmar, Afghanistan. How do you see the US, Japan and Republic of Korea Alliance and Quad Alliance role for promotion of democracy in the Indo-Pacific? Ah, uh, if in a, okay. Yes, uh, US type or European style type uh, democracy, the, they try to uh, ex teach the democracy to the other country. Uh, but in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific, the most country uh, hasn't intervened uh, domestic politics of the other countries for a long time. That's why the, if the US uh, cooperate with Japan and South Korea to, to, uh, to spread the democratic regime in the Indo-Pacific, uh, maybe it will be the quite new for Japan and South Korea, I think. Uh, but at the same time, uh, yes, uh, we know uh, um, how important democracy is. Uh, last 70 years, uh, we learned a lot from the United States and accept the democracy as uh, our political uh, philosophy. And uh, so that's why we can tell how good the democracy is. But at the same time, uh, how to teach us a country the democracy? Maybe Japan and South Korea do not know how it did. <laughs> so well, one by one, we try to persuade. And uh, we, without the will of the local people, uh, there is no uh, possibility to, uh, democracy will spread in this region, I think. So uh, just uh, introduce how good and uh, uh, persuade them to join us. And, uh, but the most important part I have already explained, we now decide the political regime of other countries. After the Cold War, because many people believed the US won the competition with the Soviet Union, that's why many countries accept the democracy. So this is very important, uh, uh, powerful persuasion to other countries. That's why I'm focusing on US-China competition. US must win. Uh, that's uh, my answer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nagao. Yeah, yes, Dr. Baird. You know, one of the key thing is, I think that uh, both South Korea and Japan are poised to, as a, a middle power in the Asia Pacific to, um, uh, to lead that charge, really, because they have uh, rise from the ashes of the war and then now become the first world country within people's lifetime, right? And people are inspired by both, both country. But the one of the things that I think that uh, uh, need to be, um, uh, fixed or, you know, to, 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 to uh, improve is the relationship between South Korea and Japan. Because their, uh, you know, historical, com uh, historical tension, right, they were not able to, um, I think, get optimized, optimized what I think they could be quite powerful together, uh, 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 you know, in the, in the region to, to do this work. But uh, because of the, the, the political tension between these two countries has been, it's a, been a little bit more difficult to, to move the ball down the field. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bird, uh, for your insight. Uh, um, I, I would like to comment on this, like uh, the same, like the Japan and Korea, like uh, India being the most populous democracy, doesn't know how to teach the democracy to the neighboring countries like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal and Bhutan. So there's a kind of uh, maybe the relations between those countries that they are just mainly focused on cultural and more historical aspect, not of the strategic competition over there, but now the China is in the focus uh, in the region. Doc, would you like to say something on the Quad uh, Alliance uh, democracy promotion in Indo-Pacific? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I guess if you're gonna we're gonna talk about quad, I gotta uh, ring in since uh, you know it is my my belly wick, I guess. Um, you, you know, 
I, I, we, one of the things I've been talking about recently is, you know, we've got to move beyond this idea of, of the quad as a dialogue if, we, if we're going to make any impact of, of this sort of nature, right? Um, it has to have some legs to it. Uh, we have to operationalize it. And, and one of those aspects, you know, look at, at the dime C construct. And part of that is the informational. How we need to get these democracies together through the quad and quad plus construct and get an a, a agreed upon uh, ideology out there for how to market uh, what it means to be a democracy in all of its different varieties. Uh, obviously, uh, we don't we don't want to come back in and, and seem imperialistic because that doesn't work well. Uh, and and you know I, I think the idea that we can look at you know what works in particular uh, nations throughout the Indo Pacific and what doesn't work in in those uh, instances and, and and try to formulate. You know some some form of uni unified messaging in, in in addition to a unified economic plan you know try, try to get the quad and, and other uh, bilateral or multilateral organizations like it uh, to, to get on the same page in its messaging uh, unify some of their economic offerings you know we, we've got uh, the blue dot network uh, from from the us for example and we've got you know look east policy and act east policy from india and we've got the Pacific Step Up in Australia. All of these are aimed at similar, uh, trying to exert similar influence in the region, but they're working at loggerheads with one another or, or being redundant in, in one way or the other. If we were to able to better operationalize the Quad and Quad Plus, we could streamline those, cut down on the redundancy, try to get everybody on the uh, at least a, a similar page, if not the same page, and, and then you know, try to make the case then that you know what what we as a as a as a uh, group of democracies uh, see as as the way forward uh, does you know resonate better with with folks in the region uh, instead of the, the authoritarianism that's being offered uh, uh, by China or, or Russia or, or others in the region, um, and you know going back to one of the questions that was asked earlier and in, in some of the. Uh, uh, responses from from Dr. Uh, Ying Hui. Um, yes, China is offering things without a bunch of strings attached in terms of political ideologies and, and building infrastructure, but it's doing so knowing, you know, that, that the countries that it's it's lending to can't pay back in, in many instances. And in those, you know, so then there's a, the strings are still attached. They're just not the strings that are out there in the open. Uh, and, and I think we need to do a little bit more marketing uh, of you know our our packages that we offer uh, don't end up with with countries losing control of airports in Uganda or uh, ports that shouldn't have been built in the first place in Sri Lanka or you know the, the new uh, port city project in Colombo is going to see China essentially having control of the, the capital of a new of another country uh, and, and doing it through this economic uh, apparatus instead of doing it through military conquest right so. Um, I think if we were to get the Quad and other uh, uh, other multilateral groups, such as what we were talking about with the uh, U.S. Uh, ROK and, and Japan uh, grouping, get them together on the same page, get them to, to take a look at the dime construct and put together a package that, that brings together diplomacy, economic development, information, military, and, and cultural exchange, and, and do so in, in a way that it's more meaningful than the, the haphazard uh, hub and spoke uh, model or whatever we're going we're gonna to call it, uh, that's when we actually have an opportunity to, to make this kind of impact. And until we do, um, we're, we're all going to be just kind of taking shots in the dark, I think. So with that, I'll shut up. Thanks, Doc. Thanks for your comments. Um, my next question, uh, I would like to take it uh, first. Uh, 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 instance, uh, Dr. Ku, how do you expect the shadow of the Myanmar coup to impact the forthcoming elections in Southeast Asia? Uh, for example, national election in Philippines and elections in some forms in Cambodia and Thailand. Uh, I, I will start it off by, um, as I mentioned just now, in this region, it is not just about uh, Myanmar. Uh, the different countries, they do have their own uh, different challenges. And we recognize that um, uh, this is an election year. 
Um, I think the another, another elections that we missed out is uh, Timor Leste's presidential elections as well also in this year. So I wouldn't really say the Myanmar has the direct impact on all these uh, um, uh, elections. After all, all these countries, Philippines also have their own challenge with the under the administrations of the Duterte. And of course, uh, Philippines are one of the most, uh, that used to be one of the most democratic countries uh, in the Southeast Asia region. Unfortunately, the, uh, um, the setback of the uh, democracies and these elections definitely is being seen as uh, one of the challenge one with the uh, different candidates that are basically, I think the only one that I have uh, that talk about democracy and human rights is uh, their current VP, uh, Lenny. So um, nevertheless, her support is not necessarily that strong. I think uh, this is, uh, um, uh, if, I, if I then uh, move to Timor Leste in which uh, they have multi-party democracies. Their presidential candidates, uh, I think at this moment, I think they have quite a huge number because I mean, their democracy space is quite big. But it translates into uh, the, the questions where, how about the quality of it? So uh, when, when we talk about um, uh, elections, really, um, even I mean, in Malaysia also, we are talking about the upcoming election because the elections here needs to be organized before July 2023. So uh, I would think uh, different countries, uh, different challenges have to view in a different uh, um, way in which in Malaysia, we normally do not announce the election date until uh, just slightly a few months before. So there's already an, an uh, 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 the level playing field is already unequal, even before the elections. I think uh, there's uh, some of the same things as well in some of the uh, regions. And uh, we're gonna have a communal uh, elections in Cambodia, but then uh, as the oppositions uh, remaining to be uh, not allowed to really operate in the, in the countries itself, uh, so how we then uh, expect um, a fair uh, level playing field for the elections uh, in some of these countries, they're going to have uh, the elections. So um, I wouldn't necessarily to say that uh, Myanmar, election, uh, Myanmar situations impact directly onto this election that already been uh, challenging in, for some time. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Po. Dr. Baird, would you like to say something on this? As, is Myanmar who is impacting the forthcoming elections in the region? Um, I, you know, I, uh, I don't know exactly how Myanmar coup would affect the, you know, the Philippines a little bit in the, uh, in the uh, archipelago, you know, they're, they're definitely in the mainland Southeast Asia, right? Mainland Southeast Asia, uh, Myanmar is the last democracy. You know, it was, so, uh, you know, and Thailand is also, I think, very concerned because Thai, there are a lot of disgruntled population within Thailand that they want to go to a more of a, a true democracy rather than um, the, uh, um, the constitutional monarch, right? So they're also looking at, so for the Thai government also, it's, they're in a kind of a difficult place. Right, uh, because they 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 are also the result of the military coup, and, and they're also concerned about that that bubbling of that uh, a group of people that want true democracy. So um, you know, I think all these uh, 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 all these uh, dynamics are going to impact on these elections, but I can't tell you exact. I don't know what it will look like what it will look like yeah but nevertheless though but overall uh one thing they are looking at is is, is that they're looking at Myanmar and they're looking at the United States you know because we are we symbolize the 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 you know the 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 uh, torchbearer of uh right democracy right and there they are in Myanmar people are fighting you know 54 million people are fighting to re Store democracy to restore uh, 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 popularly elected, um, uh, uh, you know, civilian government back. And uh, where is where are the other, you know, the democracies, right? And that could also uh, send a message to the other democracies, right? Will they be there? Do they need to start, you know? It, yeah, it just the 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 their their. Um, 
their view of the democracy may be, you know, impacted from that because of the other democracy. But one thing I want, I wanted to go back to earlier, Dr. Soroka's talking about this economic performance theory uh, and the de democracies, right? I think that one of the things that democracy can do is to make sure that their countries, you know, the inequality are in check, right? Because it goes together. So what is China has been able to do it? It's, you know, the, the whole point about democracy and you know the cap, uh, free market is all about that you know that you are going to uh, 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 the economically better, right? This system was supposed to develop, uh, uh, deliver a more uh, 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 economic growth and uh, fair economic growth, right? But what we are starting to see is that democracies, these like in the United States, you know, we have huge inequality. So then you know authoritarianism type of people can come in and say. See, democracy doesn't, you know, you can't, you, it can't guarantee you that, right? So if we wanted to save democracies, I think that one of the things they have to do is address the inequality, rising inequality in these democratic countries. Thank you, Dr. Baird. I have one question in chat. So I would like to take this question for Dr. Soroka or first. Uh, um, how might agencies like uh, USA to promote democratic norms and economic development in the Asian region uh, uh, and with the with comparison of the China's Belt Road and initiative? Well, I, I think this, this um, dovetails very nicely with what we just heard said, because I, I think the promise of the Belt and Road Initiative is economic development. So I think to the extent we can stress that, you, you know, I, I apologize, uh, but I'm going to be a little iconoclastic. And I, I think we need to get back to basics in terms of our foreign policy, uh, democracy promotion efforts. Uh, it's very nice. I, th th this, you know, goes maybe a little bit against what I said before about liberalism, but uh, it's very nice to promote these nice liberal values that I think all good people of good conscience should value. But when we lose sight of the track of what the core constituency, the people we're appealing to want, and again, survey after survey, we have this evidence. They want better democratic performance. They want better life chances for their children. They want more equitable societies. Um, maybe the place to start is with that and not trying to promote uh, various other manifestations of, of liberalism uh, or identity politics or, or things along this line. So um, I think the way to compete with the Belt and Road Initiative is to compete with them directly on what they're offering, which is economic advantage. And I, I don't think, you know, if we frame it in that perspective, I, I, I think the, the United States and the West more generally has a very compelling package to offer because these countries that are taking Chinese aid, they're not stupid. They, they understand how China is operating. They, they understand what this port diplomacy is all about, et cetera. So uh, to the extent we can address the core key concerns of these states and the people living within them, I think that's really going to be the way to build democracy out and keep USAID relevant. Thank you, Dr. Saroka. Dr. Nagao, uh, would you like to say something on U.S. aid and uh, comparison of the BRI? Uh, simply, the size of the U.S. aid uh, is not enough as a leader of the democracy. That's true, but at the same time, the U.S. U.S. strong point is uh, U.S. has arrived. That's why Japan's role or the other allies' role is important to. Uh, prepare as alternative choice for the uh, countries um, like Sri Lanka or others. So, because uh, why uh, these countries uh, uh, enter the devil or accept the devil trap of China? Because uh, when they try to choose uh, infrastructure, infrastructure projects, uh, there is no other alternative choice. So, uh, if US and the US side country prepares alternative choice, Sri Lanka uh, can choose. 
And uh, indeed, uh, in case of the Japan's experience, there was one good uh, example. Uh, when the Bangladesh uh, tried, to, uh, uh, tried to start uh, uh, infrastructure project, port project in the Chittagong, um, China suggests uh, Sonadia port project in this place. And uh, but uh, when uh, Japan understand that China suggests the Sonadi Airport project, uh, as, a, uh, or, as a alternative project, uh, Japan suggests the Matabari Port project, only 25 kilometers from Sonadi Airport. And uh, Bangladesh uh, checks the detail after that, uh, which one is workable, is the most important for Bangladesh, and Bangladesh choose Japan's Matabari Port project. Uh, that's why alternative project is useful as a counter China uh, devote diplomacy. Or BRI. So USAID can do the same thing with uh, US allies, uh, including uh, Japan, Australia, and India, uh, or other uh, European allies also. So what uh, should we do is we should strengthen our cooperation in this case. Uh, we are still strong. And that's uh, my comment about this. Thank you, Dr. Nagao. And uh, so my last questions in terms of suggestions uh, and uh, like some work for the leaders and the, uh, in the, around the world, uh, how the United States uh, uh, to be the perpetual leader of democracy and how it will act to counteract the global backslide of democracy. I, want, I would like to have the suggestions from, the, from my panelists. Uh, how can we build on this and the, for the better future. Well, that's what I was saying earlier, right? Uh, so we need to look back at our system in democracy and see uh, how can we create uh, uh, the even growth, you know, everybody share, right? Rebuild. So uh, uh, reducing that, that the rising inequality in the United States can go a long ways to send a message that our system can address, you know, the democracy you know, can that type of political system can address those things, right? Address those things. So without then, it, it, I think that that will, that will go a long way. So my, for me, it's, it's uh, addressing inequality in our own, in, in each of their own uh, thing, each of their own society and country. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Dr. Nago, would you like to suggest something? What's your uh, comments on this? Uh, sorry, I uh, just finished uh, my answer to the last question. So I forgot to listen. What is the question? So that's like, what's the suggestions for that we can build uh, better for the better future for the democracy and uh, for the promotion of democracy and uh, to counteract the global backslide of democracy? Mm, uh, maybe this is the main theme of the, this, uh, uh, main theme of the, uh, my presentation and uh, my answer for the question. Uh, simple set. But I'm focusing on what is the most important in this case uh, for the people in the, in the other countries. So who is the winner is the most persuasive. So we must win first. That is the most priority. After that, everyone want to be the winner or part of winners, they will accept democracy. So US must win. That is uh, always I said, it, US can win. That is always I said. Thank you. Dr. Soroka and Dr. Yingui, if you would like to say. Well, I, I, I think the, the points that have been made are, are very good and compelling. Um, I, I agree particularly with the point about getting our own house in order. I mean, if we're going to lead, it has to be, and here I use the term inclusively, the Western world. If we're going to lead, uh, we're going to have to lead by the power of the example. I mean, I think th th this is something that's really fallen by the wayside, you know, for um, much of the 20th century, the, the United States really was a place where other countries looked to, particularly in communist countries or in authoritarian regimes. Uh, I, I, I think now we have multiple uh, 
valences. We have uh, we are quickly becoming a polycentric world. Uh, the power of our example is not as compelling as it once was for many countries, both for economic and for normative reasons. I think the, the normative failings, I, I really want to highlight this. I think what has happened in the course of the last few years uh, has done incalculable damage to the United States as prestige abroad. Um, we're increasingly being viewed as hypocritical. We're increasingly being viewed as only out for our own interests. This of course extends back further uh, into, uh, well, I would say even into the early 1990s, but uh, it's something that we really, we really have to, we have to address in a concerted way. And I really would like to see, I mean, th this is one thing um, that I'm glad that the current administration is taking a little bit more seriously is looking at how to bring back a partnership for democracy and a discussion about what needs to be done to promote democracy, to what extent that will be fulfilled, you know, the jury's still out. Thank you, Dr. Saroka. Okay, I'll provide Dr. my, um, yeah, I'll provide my comments on, on this. I must say that just now when we talk about the notions of American exceptionalism, it's very interesting that uh, in my uh, department, actually, we have a um, um, topic on this under the course of human rights and uh, in international politics. Uh, for a long time. But I must say that uh, with the changes in the uh, uh, US uh, leadership, especially during the Donald Trump's time, it has been a, a challenge to actually talk about the notions of American exceptionalism because that, that image has been punished basically. And there's a lot of skepticism about what is the, this about American exceptionalism because there's a setback about these democracies. So, um, what, how this then impacts on uh, uh, the civil society, I would like to speak on this from the civil society's perspective is that there are sometimes that some of the civil society have been trying to use the more innovative uh, strategies to actually talk about democracy by not using the word and the term democracy itself, but they talk about governance, they talk about uh, transparency and they use the different uh, uh, elements of that democracy itself to actually try and penetrate into the public uh, in terms of their uh, democracies to popularize the sentiments of uh, citizen participation is still important, but not necessarily to be using the terminologies of democracies. So I think uh, this is something that I can um, uh, offer here. Thank you. You have to unmute Indeed, uh, Indu. Muted. Sorry. Uh, we, uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, if someone from the audience wants to ask the question from experts, please. Uh, I guess. Uh, we are good. Uh, so now I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Ernest Gunasekra Rockwell uh, for his comments. Doug. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, th thanks to everyone for a very insightful and lively discussion. Uh, it's uh, like I said earlier, you know, it, this, this was a well constructed uh, group of, of individuals to talk about this, Indu, and, and I thank you for, for putting this together. Um, you know, we, we were able to take a look at many different issues of, of democracy and, and from very different angles. And I think that uh, really contributed uh, quite well to uh, a more holistic understanding of, of what it is that, uh, that that's going on right now when we talk about you know democracies in in, in peril or uh, liberal institutions in peril or you know the, the threat that authoritarianism is posing in our world today. And uh, you know I, I very much am appreciative of the, those different perspectives that were provided and, and and thankful too to the audience for you know the the very pointed questions that they asked it's it's always uh, it always makes these things go a lot better when when the, the audience is actively engaged and asking you know insightful questions of their own uh, so that we don't have to come up with ones of our own uh, that uh, you know that we, we try to do that before the show and everything but sometimes it's a little difficult because you're so wrapped up in in the moment and everything uh uh, to, to, to do it while, it, while it's on and it's a it's a it's a, a big uh, a big help when the audience is, is so engaged so thank you um, 
we will post this out on on YouTube and and uh, hopefully we'll get some feedback from there too. So I encourage the the uh, the participants, you know, check out our website our, and our uh, our um, YouTube channel so that uh, those questions can be fielded uh, from the, the wider audience. That hopefully we'll see this once we get it out there as well. Um, and, and like I said, you know, we're, we're closing in on the uh, the uh, first anniversary of the consortium. Uh, Indu and I actually are sitting down with uh, uh, one of our members uh, this Sunday for our first podcast uh, that, that we'll hope to hopefully have up early next month, uh, just kind of reflecting back on, on everything that we've accomplished in, in the year that we've been around and, and kind of where we're headed in the, in the future. And many of you have, have been you know, uh, a, a huge part of this in multiple uh, roles and, and, and through multiple um, events like this and, and we're very appreciative of, of all of that you've put into that uh, you know Mimi uh, for example has published with us considerably uh, uh, Dr. Satoro is a member of our review board uh, for, for the for Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs Dr. Soroka has recently joined us as a, a an Arctic specialist for the consortium and is leading a team of, of folks that are going to be exploring uh, that that particular neck of the woods uh, Dr. Uh, Hui, we, we haven't ha had the uh, honor of, of having you on before, but uh, we're, we're hopeful that this is just the first of many opportunities for us to interact with you as we, we try to expand our understanding of, of uh, Southeast Asia's role in uh, the, the, the larger Indo-Pacific. Um, and uh, so again, just uh, thank you from the, uh, the consortium and from the, the, the journal, and I'll turn it back over to Indu for her closing comments. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, now, at this point, uh, I I just want to invite someone like if he is there, like uh, his hands, he wants to ask some questions, please go ahead. We have a few seconds. Could you please ask your questions? You have raised your hands. Hey, Dr. Hindu. Hello. Hi, Hi, I have, I have uh, just a comment. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, sure. yeah. This is my first uh, <coughs> webinar, and I really liked all the uh, all the comments and the, the the whole discussion. So thank you very much, everybody, for putting this together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now, at this point, uh, I would like to thank you first of all, our speakers. Uh, uh, without them, it was not possible. Dr. Saroka, Dr. Yingui, Dr. Mimi Bird, and Dr. Nagao, thank you so much for your insights and for the wonderful presentation and discussions. And uh, I, I would like to say thank you to our event management team and multimedia team who helped us a lot throughout this session to organizing this. And thank you very much our audiences who supported us throughout the year and uh, hoping to continue the, their support in this new year too. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Much. Thank you very much. Happy, uh, have a Thank good Thank you very evening. much, appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.